bwana akubariki na akulinde akuangazie uso wake na kukufariji akuinulie uso wake na kukupa amani Lord bless you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and keep your peace Lord bless you and keep you Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you. And give you peace. Amen. Amen. And a thousand generations And your family And your children And the children And the children May his favor be upon you And a thousand generations And your family And your children And the children And the children May his presence go before you And behind you And beside you All around you and within you, he's with you, he's with you In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going When you weeping and rejoicing, he's with you, he's with you Oh, amen, amen
Good morning. I am Wanda Washington, the Assistant Director of Diversity and Community and the Director to the Bridge to Success Program here at Campbellsville University. I want to thank you all for joining us today at the Ransdale Chapel as we continue our Black History Month celebration and focusing on the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It gives me great pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Gerald Smith. Now, Dr. Gerald Smith is no stranger at this facility. Uh, he has facilitated in many entities here. And the last was uh, sports and race, and we really enjoyed that. So we thank Dr. Gerald Smith for always being available. Dr. Gerald Smith, first of all, is a man of God. He's a man after God's own heart. He's a husband, a father, a preacher, a teacher, a pastor, and so much more. Time won't allow me to give him all due that he's deserved. Uh, Dr. Gerald Smith, he teaches African-American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky. He, as forementioned, he serves as a pastor of the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky. He is, his research interests include African-American history, race and sports, black freedom struggle, African-American education, and Kentucky African-American history. Now, Dr. Smith is the author and co-editor of four books. He has over 40 publications, include articles, essays, and book reviews, which have been published in historical journalism and encyclopedians. Dr. Smith is also the former chair of Kentucky African American Heritage Commission, where he serves on the Kentucky Historical Society Governing Board. Dr. Smith is the recipient of many, many awards, including the 2016 Living Legacy Award from the Kentucky Black Legislator Caucus. In 2019, he was inducted into the University of Kentucky College of Arts and Science Hall of Fame. And last, but most definitely not least, in 2015, Dr. Gerald Smith received the Campbellsville University Racial Reconciliation Award. This award is given to those who have chosen, though of those who have chosen outstanding characteristics of servants, leadership, and bringing people together, past racial matters and across lines of ethnicity, and who have been significantly bridging gaps in the community. So I'm going to step aside and bring the man that has power and passion. Thanks for joining us at Campbellsville University Black History Month Chapel. Hello everyone. I want to thank uh, the administrators, the faculty and staff, and each and every one of you who are able to tune in uh, to this uh, particular service. Uh, we're coming to you virtually, obviously, and uh, but we are still blessed to share with you what thus saith the Lord. God bless you as you move forward in your academics and pray for the Campbellsville community and the university in general that God might bless you and keep you safe in the days ahead. Uh, I'm going to share just briefly a word with you from uh, the book of Exodus chapter 14. Book of Exodus chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me now chapter 14 of Exodus, beginning with verse 19. I'm going to read uh, verses 19 through verses 31. Again, that's Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 31. And the angel of God, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that one did not come near the other all that night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. All that night it made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went after them in the midst of the sea. 
and all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. He troubled the army of the Egyptians, and he took off their chariot wheels so that they were drove, so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Verse 26. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on the horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea when the morning appeared. The sea returned to its full depth, while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Verse 28. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. In the last verse, verse 31, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. I want to highlight that 19th verse, which says, And the angel of the Lord, who went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And with those passages of Scripture in mind, I want to share from this thought, um, divine adjustments. Divine adjustments. I, uh, like many of you, have had the privilege of flying a number of different places, uh, even though I do not like to fly. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, that, that I do enjoy is when there is a smooth flight. Uh, I don't like any drama, you know, I don't like any turbulence, just want a smooth flight, don't want my blood pressure to go up, don't want that sinking feeling in my stomach, just want to enjoy the flight. Uh, and I remember um, once being on a flight uh, that um, I was flying from, I believe, San Francisco, and uh, I was coming back to Lexington, and the pilot came on, and we had reached our cruising altitude, and the pilot informed all of the passengers that um, uh, he was glad to have us on board, and he was uh, uh, going to take off the fastened seatbelt light, uh, but he informed us that in a little while that we would be encountering, and these were his words, quote, rough air. Uh, and when he said rough air, I knew what that meant. I knew that the winds were going to be unsettled. I knew that we would encounter uh, some turbulence. Uh, but I also knew that I'd come too far to turn back now. I was on the plane. I couldn't get off. All I had to do was just anticipate when he was going to turn back on the fastest seatbelt sign and I would encounter, and everyone else, some rough air. And so right there, I began to hope and pray that we would make it home safely. Uh, and sure enough, um, we began to feel some turbulence, but thank God for technology, thank God for the instruments on the plane and the skill of the pilot, uh, that when we did encounter that rough air, uh, the pilot uh, began to make uh, some adjustments. Uh, in other words, uh, he decided that it would be good uh, and possible that if he could avoid the rough air, if he went up or he went down in altitude. And sure enough, he did that and we had a smooth flight home. And what I'm saying, the first point that I want to make is that given the fact that if man, uh, a pilot, can control some instruments uh, to make an adjustment that we would not have to go through rough air, that you and I serve a mighty God, an awesome God, a God who is made, able to make adjustments here on earth uh, that we might avoid rough air because we know that we serve a God who sits high and looks low and a God who has the whole world in his hands. God is able uh, to offer divine adjustments. When I say divine adjustments, I'm talking about adjustments that are holy and righteous and pure and perfect. Uh, for our good and for his glory. And so just for a moment, as we look here 
uh, in Exodus chapter 14, uh, we'll find God making some divine adjustments on behalf of the children of Israel. Bible readers know that without doubt that uh, for uh, several hundred years the children of Israel were held in bondage, in captivity. Uh, they were working from sun up to sundown, making bricks without straw. Uh, it was a difficult time for them over and over again in bondage and in slaves. There was no vacation pay, no life insurance, no medical insurance, no slow down, same old regret, same old struggle, same old difficulties every day. But God then had an encounter with a man named Moses on the backside of a mountain, told Moses to let my people go, to go to Pharaoh and make, give him that command, that message that Pharaoh should let his people go, that he had heard their cries and seen their tears. And so Moses, in obedience to the Lord, goes to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was stubborn. He was hard-hearted. Uh, ten plagues came, and then finally Pharaoh let the children of Israel go, even allowed them to leave and take some jewelry and clothes and all that they had, they had had even worked for without pay. And so now as they leave Egypt, uh, they are on their way to the land of milk and honey, to the promised land. God could have taken them by a short route, but he took them the longer distance. But what God did do, he did not leave them nor forsake them now that he had delivered them. What the Lord does is that God is a pillar of fire by night, amen, and he's a pillar of cloud by day. That God was right with them, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. They knew that God was with them. And we know that a pillar is a standing architectural structure. It's tall, it's strong, it's solid. And along the way that they could look up in the middle of the night and they would see the pillar of fire. They knew that God was right with them. They could look out in the daytime and see the pillar of a cloud and know that God was right with them. But every now and then as they made their way to the promised land, the Lord would move. There would be an adjustment. And the Bible tells us that as they were making their way, they get to the Red Sea. And there's Pharaoh's army behind them, and there are mountains on the right and mountains on the left. In other words, they had encountered an obstacle that was going to hinder their progress, an obstacle that was going to restrict their freedom, an obstacle that was going to obstruct their view, their anticipation of reaching the promised land. And my brothers and sisters, all of us in times of our lives, when you live long enough and you try to follow the Lord, you and I will encounter obstacles in life. Sometimes that obstacle is a member of our families. I wish I had a witness in here, but I got to preach to these four walls. Sometimes the obstacle is a co-worker or a neighbor. Sometimes the obstacle is a financial challenge or a health challenge. All of us encounter some sort of obstacles in life. And since I'm speaking to you at Campbellsville University, if you're taking courses right now, which I knew you are, maybe you're in the middle of a class and you're thinking, oh Lord, I, I'm trying to get through this class in order to graduate, but now I'm encountering an obstacle. If you don't mind if I just take two minutes that uh, as I was an undergraduate student, I encountered obstacles. And, and one of the obstacles that I encountered in trying to graduate from the University of Kentucky was a biology course. Lord have mercy. It still mm, gets on me when I think about it right now. I remember, I remember my, my junior year, the first semester of my junior year, I'm in this biology class. And, and I ended up getting an F. I failed the course. Lord have mercy. And I'm trying to think, I've got to graduate. I've got to get out of this biology class. And, and then I took that course another semester. In fact, the following semester. And believe it or not, I kid you not, I failed biology twice. Lord, that was an obstacle. I thought, I'm not going to graduate because I cannot finish. I cannot complete. I cannot even get a D in biology. Lord have mercy, but God is good. And you know the rest of the story. I was able to get past my 
obstacle. But, but sometimes, sometimes when we encounter obstacles, we want to do like the children of Israel did. The Bible tells us that when they got to the Red Sea, they began to blame Moses. You know how it is. Sometimes we want to blame somebody else when we can't get to where we're trying to get to. And not only did they blame Moses, I'm sure that they were like many of us. Some of of uh, them, no doubt, like us, questioned God. Said, Lord, you know, uh, I stepped out here and things aren't working out like I thought they would work out. There's an obstacle. I can't so see no way in, no way out. And you know how it is. We all question God if things do not materialize immediately. But, but then sometimes, my brothers and sisters, we even question ourselves when we encounter an obstacle. We blame ourselves. We, we, we get to that, I wish I should have, could have point. I wish I had a witness in here. We, we, we get to that point that, Lord, I, I, I should have just stayed where I was. I, I was in a comfort zone, but, but yet and still, I thought I was going to do something right, and I stepped out here. I should have stayed where, where I was. And you know, that's what the children of Israel thought. They, in fact, they blamed Moses and said, Moses, uh, what is it? Then why did you bring us out here into the desert to die? Uh, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Why did you bring us here? Surely somebody said, uh, I should have stayed in Egypt. Now I'm here at the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army is behind me. There's 600 chariots, two men in each chariot, one to fight, one to drive. Looks like we're going to drown in the Red Sea. I should have just stayed in Egypt. But then sometimes, folks, uh, we forget where the Lord has brought us from when we encounter an obstacle. And just that quick, they had forgotten that the Lord had delivered them out of Egypt and got them to where they were. But God is a good God. He just won't leave you standing. And the Bible tells you and I that he had already spoken to Moses and Moses speaks to the people and Moses tells them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. For the Egyptians that you see today, you are not going to see anymore. God tells Moses, said, come on now, get it together. Uh, I'm going to take care of it all for you. And Moses lifts up his rod. And the Bible tells us that when Moses lifts up his rod, and after he has encouraged the children of Israel, an east wind blows all night long, and the children of Israel are able to walk over on to dry land. But before that happened, don't forget what takes place in that 19th verse, because that's that's where we see the divine adjustment. That's what happens before the water is parted. Watch what it says. It says, and the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. Lord have mercy. And the pillar of cloud went before them and stood between them. So it became, so, so it became the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Um, let me back up, let me back up, let me read that again. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. Watch verse 20. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus, it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. There it is. I'm about ready to close right now because I'm coming up on 20 minutes. Understand what happened that God had made a divine adjustment. Isn't he a mighty good God? What God did is that he fixed it so that there was something in between. There was a barrier that kept the children of Israel from going back. In fact, not only could they go back, they couldn't even see back because it was darkness behind them, but it was light in front of them. Isn't he a mighty good God? When you and I in our lives want to go back God, by his grace and by his mercy, will make a divine adjustment so we can not only look back, we can't even go back if we want to. Lord have mercy. But God just kept a light in front of them, so it was darkness to the Egyptians, but it was light 
to the Israelites. Isn't he a mighty good God? And Lord, I thank you for all the divine adjustments that you have made in my life. You've been better to me than I've been to myself. There have been times in my life where I've needed some fixing, some mending. I've needed to be straightened out and straightened up. And I know that God will make your rough places smooth and your crooked places straight. Somebody ought to say amen. When, when I look at God's word, I find that there were a number of times where God performed a divine adjustment. Amen. And all we got to do is look back to Calvary. Yeah, Jesus died there on the cross. In fact, dies on the cross with a crown of thorns in his head and nails in his hands and feet. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. Amen. They thought Jesus was dead. Uh, yeah, yeah, the devil was dancing and prancing and Martha and Mary were moaning and groaning, but early Sunday morning on that third and appointed day, God made a divine adjustment. Jesus got up from the grave with all power in heaven and earth in his hands. And because Jesus lives, you and I can have a life and have it more abundantly. Somebody, wherever you are right now, whether you're in a dorm room, whether you're in an apartment, whether you're in your home, wherever you are right now, you ought to say, Lord, I'm going to praise you for all the divine adjustments you've made in my life. You fixed it where I could go to college. You fixed it where I could get a job. You brought me in connection, in contact with somebody that was going to give me the wisdom and knowledge to help usher me along. Thank you, Lord, for divine adjustments. Somebody ought to praise him right now. Just saying amen, amen, amen. And I got news for you. There is no secret for what God can do. For what he's done for others, he will do for you. Praise God, Campbellsville, for his divine adjustments. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you is my prayer.